ESPN College Football Podcast. Welcome into the ESPN College Football Podcast for Thursday, June 9th. We're winding towards the season. I think within, within 90 days to the start of the college football season. I'm Adam Rittenberg, joined by my friend, colleague, and fellow suffering Cub fan, David Hale. And we will get into uh, Cubs failures uh, later on in the show. But we're excited right off the top to be joined by Miami Athletic Director Dan Radakovich, who has had a, uh, an interesting year like many in his line of work. And, and Dan, I wanted to start this off by asking you what it was like or what it has been like for you to make a big personal change, professional change, uh, and, and, and go from Clemson to Miami during a year where there has been so much change around college athletics, because Clemson, you know, had, had been for, you know, and really still could be for years, uh, such a stable, successful place. And then you make this move at a time when so many things are changing changing in, in, in the country and in, in, in college sports. So what, what, what have the last uh, eight or nine months been like for you? Well, Adam, thanks. And good to see you, David, as well. Um, no one ever said I was really smart um, to be able to make these kind of big changes all at the same time. Uh, it, it's a little bit of the, the old chaos theory. You have a lot of different things happening. So um, maybe it's a good time for change. But uh, seriously, I, I got to know some of the folks at the University of Miami when their job was was open. And uh, I, having gone to school there, I have my MBA from there, lived, worked there in the, in the mid uh, 1980s and lived in South Florida throughout the 80s. Um, really, it, you know, it had a lot of affinity for the school. Uh, and when some of the folks on campus and uh, had a chance to speak with them, uh, as well as the hiring of Mario Cristobal, um, which kind of were, were running along similar railroad tracks to uh, my conversations. It just seemed like the right time to make this sort of move. Um, you know, we did a lot of great things at, at Clemson. Coach Sweeney's phenomenal, along with, you know, President Clements and a lot of the, uh, you know, the infrastructure there at Clemson, which uh, was, was a lot of fun to be around. Um, but this was a unique challenge uh, to be able to come here and, and hopefully work with Mario, work with the people on campus to really move the University of Miami back into a position of prominence. My, my hope is that somewhere there are some photos of Dan Radakovich in the mid 80s in Miami, like totally Don Johnson look and uh, very Miami Vice. That's <laughs> uh, I'm going to need you to share that at some point. Um, one of the things that I think was is at the heart of Clemson's success, and I think you've said it, President Clemens has talked about it, Dabo, and certainly the amount of consistency that he had there with, with uh, assistant coaches is the word alignment. And that gets brought up so much when we talk about successful programs or the flip side of that is ones who should be more successful and aren't is because there's not an alignment within the program. It's not just about the head coach. It's not just about having the top recruits. It's about having everybody sort of rowing the boat in the same direction. And I'm, I'm curious, coming from a place where that alignment was so uh, critical to the foundation, did you have concerns about that coming to Miami? How much is that sort of like the, the biggest sort of first piece of the puzzle is let's get everyone on the same page with the same vision at Miami? Well, being fortunate to have, have seen it and been a part of it, uh, at Clemson, um, I, I think I can help the University of Miami get to that similar point. Are we there today? No, we've only been together five or six months. Um, so it's going to take a little longer to, to create that kind of alignment. But I, I think it's hard to be able to do anything if you haven't really been a part of it before. So being able to talk to the institution, institutional representatives, members of the board, certainly translating with uh, the football program with Mario. You know, I think it's going to be a, 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 a work in progress, but because Mario's seen it at some of his stops and I've seen it at some of mine, I think we can, we can kind of pull this together um, very, very quickly with the folks on campus because there's a great desire uh, by campus to have that type of alignment uh, that allows the athletic program to move ahead uh, very, very quickly. 
Dan, of, of all those groups that you're dealing with, who who is the most important to either get on board or continue to get support from, you know, to, to, to kind of accelerate things? Because that was a big part in hiring both yourself and, and Mario. But as you know, it can't just be the hires. It has to be continued uh, buy-in to be able to push the program forward and ultimately get back to what um, everyone at Miami wants is, is to be on the national championship stage. Well, it's a great question, Adam. And I think that, you know, up to this point, I would give equal weight to, um, you know, the, the some members of the board. The board at the University of Miami is very large, uh, but there's a smaller executive committee that kind of runs things day to day. So, you know, utilizing that group and, and, and telling our story to that group um, is, is very important. But before you can get to the board of trustees, you have to make sure that the folks on campus, the university CEO, uh, you know, our, our associate VP, our CFO, all the people that run the day-to-day -day work here have to really understand what our vision is and what our priorities are because they have to, they have to really help us as we move forward to the ultimate authority, which is the, which is the board of trustees. So we are, we are looking at what the um, items that we need uh, to be successful, both from a facility perspective and a funding perspective, and, and really getting ready to make the case to the institution, here's where we need to go. I'm so fascinated by all of the changes that are going on in college football in general, and I think um, you're probably as as educated and sharp on on some of these things as anyone, but you're also sort of dropped in the middle of it. And, and NIL, certainly being one of them, Miami has been at the forefront of NIL discussions, uh, you have, I, I don't know whether you want to say you're lucky or unlucky that you have a lot of folks around the school who want to be a part of, of the Miami uh, resurgence and want to uh, share their wealth where they can, um, maybe sometimes where they might not be supposed to. I don't know uh, that, that that has been the case in the past. And I'm sure it's a thing where you've got to do a lot of educating, but in a, in a marketplace and then in a time where there's a lot of stuff that's just unknown in general. Like what, what's it been like for you to kind of wrap your arms around NIL and all of the kind of ancillary folks that, that are a part of, of A, making NIL successful, but that also can kind of be pushing an envelope a little bit, maybe in a direction that, that you've got to be wary of. Well, I think that, you know, we, we have some great um, benefactors here at the University of Miami, you know, folks, uh, I mean, like John Ruiz, you know, John obviously has been in the news and, and done a lot of uh, really good things. I mean, um, trying to keep John's name out of anything is just impossible. So it's, <laughs> you know, it, it's there and, and he, he does a great job. But, you know, I've had the opportunity to have a chance to meet him a couple of times. And he is really a he's a very, very good businessman, a wonderful lawyer, a great fan of the University of Miami. And, you know, there are others uh, as well uh, that we've been able to meet who are business people looking to expand their product horizons and utilizing the opportunity to have student athletes do that um, with their company. So uh, we have very fertile ground here in, the, in South Florida and in the Miami area for uh, name, image and likeness opportunities. And I think some of our student athletes are beginning to take advantage of those. Dan, we're about a year into NIL. You experienced you know, pretty much the first half at Clemson and then the second half at Miami. What's been the thing that surprised you the most and maybe the thing that, that you kind of expected that, that has turned out to be the way it is, even though maybe it surprises some of the rest of us? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, the first, the first six months were really about, um, you know, we were outside of all the, the, the recruiting pieces. So it was really the student athletes who were, who were, um, who were on campus. I think the second half of the, of, of that first year um, started to show that maybe there's opportunities and, and the NCAA has, has since clarified, you know, their guidance on this uh, as it relates to not utilizing it as an incentive to uh, attend a school. Uh, so I, I think that we just have to continue to grow and learn and understand those things. I don't know, Adam, if there's any one thing that surprised me, um, because um, I can't say that I had a preconceived notion as to what was going to happen. I knew, I knew this, though. Um, the idea that we need to have some type of general guardrails, uh, preferably from the federal government as it relates to these things, 
that's that's a bedrock. We we need to have that happen. So uh, that was something that 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 all of us in the business had had really desired um, before the first year of of NIL. But you know, it, we've gotten through it. Uh, I'm sure it will change as time goes on uh, because everything seems to. Um, you know, especially in intercollegiate athletics over the last um, three to five years. I mean, things have just been, you know, in, in, incredibly, it, it, it's changed more in that time than maybe it had in the previous 20. So um, we, we just have to be able to be nimble and, and understand that change is going to be uh, part of the day-to-day operations here in intercollegiate athletics for the foreseeable future. Well, on that note, there's sort of, a, I think, always this big elephant in the room, particularly when it comes to the ACC of revenue. And you guys have done such a wonderful job of investing in the program over the last year. And I know you have big plans on the horizon as well. Um, but, you know, the flip side of that is that uh, Miami competes in a league that just had its most successful financial year ever. And we're still talking about a number that is probably half of what the Big Ten is likely going to be bringing in in its next contract uh, TV deal. And um, I'm curious, how, how big of, of, a, of an item, agenda item is that on your sort of radar of, look, if we're planning out what Miami is over the next decade, that's a number that needs to be addressed. And is it, does it at some point, if, the, if the, the trend lines continue to split between you know, two power leagues and the rest of the Power Five and everybody else, does it become sort of an existential threat for at least sort of the basics of how college football works right now? Um, yes. Uh, yeah, for, from an answer perspective, <laughs> yes. <laughs> All of the answer. things that you just said, David, I mean, you're 100% correct. I mean, we're, we're concerned. It could be a threat. Um, you know, this is why we have commissioners and, you know, people in, in our home office in, in, in Greensboro, um, to be able to help work on that. The athletic directors talk about it all the time. What can we do um, to help, help, help further our cause? Um, there are contracts in place. There are uh, rights agreements in place um, that are, are, are there, and, and, and those contracts have, have been made. So, you know, it, it's going to be um, different, but I'm looking forward to continuing the the conversation to see how we can impact that and, and possibly change it. Uh, because if you just take the um, soliloquy that you just um, mentioned, um, we're, uh, we're going to be a little bit behind the, the eight balls as it relates to dollars and how those, how you make that up um, that reverts back to each individual campus and decisions that are made on each, each one of our campuses. Um, so we'll, uh, We'll continue to see how that works, but it's certainly a, a, a an everyday an everyday issue for Commissioner Phillips and and our our uh, staff in Greensboro. Hey Dan, I'm asking a lot of people right now just your confidence level in at least with college football, all the key constituents working together. I'm really the Power Five commissioners in some ways because, you know, David mentioned it. The Big Ten has a media agreement that they'll be announcing probably within the next month. The Pac-12 will have a new uh, rights negotiation. The SEC ha- has has obviously done some things um, lately in terms of realignment to strengthen itself. So how, how much of this sport in your mind is someone who's obviously spent most of his career in the ACC is siloed and, 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 and or is there a underlying spirit to work together? Do you think that's even possible for some of these big issues that are affecting everyone, but also affecting leagues in different ways? You know, Adam, I, I truly believe that at some point in time, the, the, the five power five leagues need to come together and, and really look at what the future is going to be. Um, it, it's you know, looking at, 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 at those schools are we're, we're a little bit different um, than some of the other division one schools. We've, we've got to be able to look to help make um, uh, make those decisions that, that are right for the, the uh, power five uh groups and leagues. Sure, there's going to be some leagues that have their, their television rights up and um, you know, maybe they're in a good position for one year or, or another in, in, in a few others. The, the ACC um, you know, has a while before we go through that. But we're also, I think, very important to the landscape of, of college football. I mean, there's incredible brands inside the, the ACC, whether you know, in, in football. I mean, you're looking at 
obviously Clemson, uh, Florida State, Miami, Virginia Tech. These are these are national brands that have had incredible success over time. So you know to have the opportunity to bring all those together and 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 keep the league moving forward and a part of the Power Five, I, I really would look to. And again, I'll go back to the idea that. So much has changed over the last five years. We would not five years ago, if we were sitting here, you would not be asking me the questions that you're asking me. So I truly believe that in the next five years, there will be a whole different set of questions. And if our commissioners get together and are able to look at, you know, where can we go uh, as as a power five group, specifically as it relates to football, I think we'll uh, I think we'll be in a good spot. And. I think we'll keep uh, college football at its um, at its very very high level of of, of dominance uh, within the marketplace. If it was five years ago, we'd be have we'd be talking like satellite camps and cost of attendance. So if that like that, I feel like that dates things properly for you. Um, well, one of the things that I uh, it hasn't been an issue that I think all of the conference commissioners have had to work together on, but it seems like one that they're all sort of addressing at the same time right now is the idea of how to actually construct your conference, whether you're doing divisions and how you're going to set up scheduling. Um, it feels to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it feels to me like everybody sort of embraces the big picture idea of we need to change something and figure out a way to get uh, maximize our TV inventory and the best matchups and have schools see each other more often. And then you get into the nuts and bolts of what to do, uh, as you guys did in Amelia Island uh, not too long ago, and the SEC just did in Destin. Uh, a week or so ago, and the conversations start getting much more stressful and difficult. Where do things stand with the SEC, or I'm sorry, with the ACC on that right now? And do you think this is sort of an inevitability for all the leagues that that they're going to kind of go in that direction one way or another? David, I think when you ask 14 people um, to come to a decision in the ACC, or maybe I guess it's um, 14 in the uh, SEC to make their decisions from an athletic director's perspective, um, you're never going to come to a consensus uh, on that. Too much parochialism comes, comes into it. I think the, the athletic directors need to give some input and then coming, it, it needs to come from the conference, you know, the, the end result, uh, because otherwise there's always going to be someone who feels a little bit disenfranchised. And I think we've done that in the ACC pretty well. We, we created a subgroup. We came forward with, with some scheduling models, threw something out there. The ADs talked about it. Now it's sitting back with the, the conference, and uh, they're making some tweaks to it, and, and it'll come back to the um, ADs at some point in time within the next few months for a, for a final vote. Um, but if you threw 14 ADs into a room together, ask them to do the scheduling piece, uh, I think that, would, that wouldn't work very well at all. Yeah, and just last one for you. you. You've had some time now to be around Mario Cristobal. Uh, I'm wondering what has stood out most to you, you know, just being with him on a pretty much daily basis in his return to Miami because uh, you hear about his recruiting approach and the relentlessness he takes towards that. Um, obviously, he's been around some different programs since he was last at Miami, including Alabama, obviously at Oregon as an assistant and, that, and then as the head coach and had success there. What, 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 are some, what are some things people don't know about Mario and his approach that, that you obviously see being a lot closer to him? You know, I, I, you use the word um, relentless, and, and I think that is a good word. Um, to describe Mario, whether it's in recruiting or um, recruiting student athletes or recruiting his staff. I mean, you, you, you know, I think that he took an incredibly intelligent approach um, as it related, didn't have to get everybody on board right away, took his time, got, got some, some really good coaches at the end. And I think that um, that showed patience, that showed maturity on his part, um, knowing, you know, keeping the important thing, the important thing, which is getting the right people here and not worried about the, the timing of, of all of it. Recruiting, you guys know this, recruiting is 365 days a year. I mean, that's, that's just how, how football coaches work. Um, and he is just, he enjoys it. And like anything you might enjoy, you're going to try to do it well. Um, so I've been, I've been really surprised that at his level of organization, his ability to uh, Mario knows a lot of people in Miami. Uh, I shouldn't have found that to be surprising, 
uh, having had him grow up here and, and play here. But my goodness, he knows a lot of people here. And, uh, you know, everybody has an affinity and a fondness to, uh, to Mario. So uh, it's just, it, it's been a pleasure. And we, we still have a lot of, a lot of things to get over and things to, to, to work through, but um, certainly uh, excited about the prospect of continuing to assist him and, and, and all the other coaches here at the University of Miami as we continue to move the athletic program forward. I know uh, it's been a great conversation. It's been, people are super excited about Miami. I'm personally excited, Dan, uh, that the next time my wife is yelling at me about rambling on about God knows what, I'm going to say, Dan Radakovich called that a soliloquy. And so you can't, can't get mad at me for this. So anyway, <laughs> thank you very much. I appreciate all of it. Well, guys, it's always a pleasure. Anytime I can help, just give me a call. You have a great afternoon. Dan, thanks so much. All right, guys. Take care. Before we move on, I want to recommend a great pairing of podcasts, The Hoop Collective with Brian Windhorst and The Low Post with Zach Lowe. Last night, they crossed streams and recorded a joint podcast from the floor of the TD Garden reacting to Game 3 of the NBA Finals. The guys discussed Boston overcoming big performances from Steph Curry and Klay Thompson, the Celtics managing their turnovers being the key to the series, Jason Tatum's ability to move the ball, and if Curry can overcome being an underdog in the series. You can listen to that episode in both the Low Post and the Hoop Collective's feeds, and you can find both of those shows wherever you listen to podcasts. Also, check out the latest ESPN 30 for 30, the greatest mixtape ever. It's a story of how a series of streetball videos set to music in the 90s transformed the game forever. Stream now on ESPN Plus and listen to the companion 30 for 30 podcast, a streetball mixtape. Great to talk with Miami Athletic Director Dan Radakovich there, David, and I'm with you. I'd love to see some uh, 1984 Miami Vice era Dan Rad pick. She still has the great hair, which uh, which I wish I had. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, obviously a guy that, again, is at a really interesting place right now at a really interesting time. Um, I know both of us probably were some degree of surprised when he made that move. You know, why would you leave Clemson for anywhere? Uh, but I, I think it makes sense the more you hear about the challenge and the buy-in that Miami has. And I know you and Andre Adelson have written about this uh, quite a bit, uh, that Miami's in a very different place and they're going for it. And they're finally committed to trying to win championships once again at the U. Uh, wh what do you think will be the biggest storyline you know, in this first season for Mario Cristobal and really for that athletic program as they try to get closer to Clemson, to be honest, in the ACC but then ultimately getting closer to getting to the college football playoff and trying to win a national title again. Uh, you know, I mean, part of it is exactly the, the, the word that I brought up was just alignment. And this has been a huge issue at Miami. I mean, uh, they, they've had a president who historically has not been um, super involved hands-on, which might be a good thing, but has sort of left a power vacuum that I don't know that it was fully supported by boosters that, that the previous AD or head coaches have been able to fill properly. The other downside or upside, depending on how you want to look at it, Miami, is that you have a lot of invested folks so that you have these former players who want to see Miami be great again. You have, we mentioned some of those big name boosters that want to see Miami be great again. And everybody wants greatness for Miami. But then the question is like, how do you go about doing that? And we've had I think a lot of people pulling in different directions, a lot of cooks in the kitchen, so to speak. And so I think that Dan's arrival at Miami, to me, uh, amid all of the offseason changes, was probably the most important there because it, it, it fills that power vacuum. It provides a center uh, that says, look, here's, here's, where, here's the vision. And yes, I'm excited that you want to be a part of it. And yes, I'm excited that you want to be a part of it. Here's where we're going. Here's how you can help as opposed to just saying everybody for themselves, somebody make Miami better. Um, I don't know if that happens this year. I mean, it, it's sort of hard to say that, that a program that has gone from pretty mediocre over the better part of 20 years now suddenly becomes a playoff level program. They have a very good head coach. They are recruiting well. They have done very well in the portal. They have a quarterback that many think can be a genuine difference maker. Those things are great. And, and part of the again, sort of the double-edged sword of Miami is that now I think a lot of folks are excited. So what happens if early on things don't go quite according to plan? Um, does the buy-in, does the alignment all still stand 
even through some potential uh, pitfalls between now and where they want to be. I, I think things are in a much better place at Miami today than they have been in a long time. But, you know, Miami is sort of like the junior version of Texas and that we've been saying they're back for a long time and they don't quite get there and people aren't necessarily patient enough to see any vision through to the end. Yeah, I, I think I love what you said about Dan being the center, like basically some a stabilizing force for Miami because there's just too much chaos around the program. Uh, there has been. There's talent and there's great players, but then there's off-field problems and there's money problems. And it, it kind of reminds me of almost a junior version of LSU. Like they always have that potential to go on a run, but but are they ever going to be stable enough and in control enough to do it? And I, I do think in, in both LSU's hire with Brian Kelly and and maybe with Miami's hire and Mario Cristobal, along with Dan Radakovic, that that's as much a part of it as Mario's ability to recruit is his ability to run a program and and have it be uh, kind of a, a steady program that can then grow into being a national championships contender. And so I, I do wonder, especially because you asked about the NIL and they, they have been one of the biggest NIL stories in the last almost year, along with programs like Texas A&M, like USC, he brought up John Ruiz, who's definitely been in the news a lot. Um, do you think this thing is uh, going to be a, a, a net positive for Miami, or is it going to be difficult for Dan and for Mario and for others at that university to navigate? Well, again, we talk about what, what is the big problem? Too many cooks in the kitchen. This does open up that possibility for there to be too many cooks in the kitchen. I think, you know, you have talked to as well, I'm sure plenty of coaches and ADs who worry that um, not necessarily about the, the financial stake of NIL in the sport, but the boosters who kind of want to have their own fantasy football team by supplying a lot of NIL money. Um, and what do they think they get out of that? What is their return, their expectation of a return? I think all of those things can be very good questions. And that's where having strong leadership within that uh, model is is important um, to say like, look, hey, you know, I appreciate that you have spent money here. I appreciate that you're supporting our players. Um, but at the end of the day, the coach decides who plays. The coach decides how many snaps that guy gets. Um, and, and we decide what, what recruits we're going to get. And we decide how the program is going to be run. I, this is not just a problem at Miami or a potential problem at Miami. I think there are a lot of folks who are worried about that, but Miami is a very good example of where the NIL uh, names are very high profile. Uh, I think the money can certainly be significant and it is a place where they are just trying to build the football foundation now. And when you have too many people coming in saying, no, 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 let's build the foundation this way. And I'll, 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 I'll be the general contractor deciding <laughs> all of this. That's where you run into problems. So again, it helps that somebody with Dan's track record and my, and Mario's ties to the community and, and the folks that, you know, as Dan mentioned, how many folks he knows down there, relationships and experience are everything in this, in this mindset. There's really a feeling to me, and I think you'd agree that if if these two men can't get it right at Miami, it probably isn't <laughs> going to happen. Especially with the buy-in that they have, uh, you know, to invest the way that they have invested in the way that they say they're going to invest going forward. I also wanted to ask uh, you your reaction on what Dan had to say regarding the ACC because uh, I think the you know the question about revenue is the biggest question going forward, and what are they going to do? Um, when, when the big 10 has its deal and the sec is already making money, like it has the PAC 12, even though the PAC 12 is a, a pinata around college football for a lot of people, they have a chance to go to market and renegotiate their media rights. Their commissioner on this very podcast told Heather Dinich and I last week, he believes all, uh, live rights are undervalued in college athletics, but for the ACC, they're not in that position. You were at ACC meetings not long ago. What is the level of concern to Dan's point? Is there anything athletic directors can do to collectively? I agree with them. The ACC has a very important place in, in the history of college athletics, but what does the future hold for that conference, um, especially in football, given these widening revenue gaps? I mean, it's such a fascinating discussion because, you know, we're talking about double-edged swords. Well, the ACC's grant of rights, which runs through 2036, is one of those double-edged swords. It is currently the thing that is holding the league together because uh, when the Texas and Oklahoma news happened last year and every single person in college football looks around and says, holy crap, what's going to happen to us? I think there are probably programs within the ACC and, and Dan may or may not have been 
uh, AD at two of them at this point <laughs> that would have picked up and jumped ship because of those revenue differences. What held the league together was the grant of rights. On the other hand, you are stuck with the deal that you are in through 2036. That's an insane thing to think about. Um, and look, I've talked to some ADs around the league who have said, quite frankly, are we getting paid enough? No. Are we being paid a fair market value for the product that we have put on the field? Probably we are. And that's where the inherent thing is. They're saying, yeah, I need more money, but they're not doing anything that has warranted more money. If you, I, and again, I've said like, what do you do to fix this? Step one, Miami needs to be good. Florida State needs to be good. Have programs that, that are generating the type of fan interest and national interest that makes a TV network set up and say, okay, maybe we do want to pay you a little bit more money to make sure that the stability of this league is lasting. Um, I think that's, that's a huge part of it. Um, you know, Dan referenced the fact that in some cases, these schools are sort of on their own to bridge these revenue gaps. Some of them are much better positioned to do it than others. Miami being one of them, uh, both because of location and history. Uh, that's not going to be true for all. And I know there's some ADs that, that think that the best way for the ACC to succeed is to keep their best programs. And maybe that means not having uh, an even revenue distribution, that revenue should be distributed uh, proportionate to investment in football or significance of wins and, and, and what they're bringing to the table. But all of these things are ideas, but they're sort of none of them are a definitive magic bullet. Um, and a lot of what's been talked about, you know, Jim Phillips is hiring uh, a position called the chief revenue officer, a person whose entire job is how, how are they going to get more revenue? All of these things feel like they're kind of working around the edges of a problem that is much bigger. You're, you're, you're putting a, a Band-Aid on a bullet wound in some extent. Yeah, it, I think it's a great way to describe it. And we didn't ask Dan specifically about super conferences, but I want to ask you because it, it's out there, the idea that there's going to be a tier of programs that can compete at, at a certain level and invest based on their revenues. I think the most interesting part of that isn't whether Alabama is going to be in or Ohio State's going to be in. We know that they would and they will be, but the, the, the programs at the margins. And I think there are quite a few of those in the ACC. So if you had to go down the list of ACC programs that could function under that type of system where, you know, you have to be generating this amount of revenue, you have to be bringing in these types of television ratings, you essentially have to be in on football to this level to be part of this elite group. Who's in that group from the ACC? That's a great question. And, and one part of that question is about revenue, of course. The other part is about philosophy. Do you view yourself as a school that sees football as foundational to what your school's philosophy is all about? Um, you know, it's funny. I, I, when, when the chaos was happening last summer and the more I talked to people about, well, are we going to super conferences and what's going to happen? Are we going to start paying players? Will there still be amateurism? All of these things. And like one of the schools that came up a whole lot in that conversation was Notre Dame, which you would assume is as tied to the, the, the brand of Notre Dame and college football are as overlapping there as anywhere in the country. On the other hand, you have Notre Dame's president who effectively said, if we're going to pay players, then we'll take our ball and go home. And plenty of others have sort of made this sort of statement. I think when rubber hits the road and you're forced to make a decision, um, most places are going to go where the money is. Um, so then the question, again, comes back to where's the money? I think you look at a place like Duke, I don't know that they've ever cared that much about college football. I don't think that they feel like that it's part of their philosophy. And I don't think that they feel like they've got the revenue to keep, to keep pace. That might be true at a place like Virginia, at Syracuse, at Boston College. I think those are all very good um, uh, candidates to say, like, I don't know if we want to play at, at this. I don't know if we want to ante up at this table. Um, the ones that are most interesting to me probably are you know, Pittsburgh, which they're in a difficult position of being – in a major metro area competing against the pros. Uh, they do not have sort of the major revenue that, that a Clemson or a Florida State or Miami might command. On the other hand, they have a very rich college football history and a very passionate fan base, even if it's not the biggest one. Um, NC State, I think, is another good example of a team where you think they probably could be more than they are. Maybe the most interesting one to me is Wake Forest, because if you'd asked this question five years ago, you would have said, well, yeah, of course not Wake Forest. They're really doing a great job both winning football games, uh, 
getting boosters to buy in and shell out money for new facilities. They have a coach that wants to play ball at the highest level. They have an AD that wants to play ball at the highest level. The entire mindset around Wake Forest football has shifted massively in just the last few years. I think they're a team that would say, if you're going to, if you're going to offer a seat at the table, hell yes, we'll take it. No doubt. I mean, it would be deflating for Wake Forest fans to basically have the most successful sustained period in their history and then have to move down a level. I think that would be really tough for them. Uh, David, as you know, we're uh, we're getting through the offseason here on the podcast and uh, looking at a letter as we get closer to that lead up to the 2022 season. I hosted the the podcast last week with Heather Dinich and we had the letter P and I was definitely concerned uh, for whoever was on the, 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 the subsequent show because it was Q. I, I was con- concerned about uh, the producer Taylor and, and obviously the host. Well, you and I are the hosts and I think uh, Taylor must have known something by having you on because you just put together the definitive list of quarterback tiers in college football. So there's your letter Q for you. We don't have any teams. We don't have any coaches, but we have quarterbacks to break down. You did a great job of doing that for ESPN.com. Highly recommend everybody checking out uh, David's uh, ranking all 131 quarter college football quarterback situations in tiers. So the top tier, no big surprise there. The reigning Heisman Trophy winner in Bryce Young from Alabama the guy who many of us think will win the Heisman Trophy this year and C.J. Stroud from Ohio State, and then Caleb Williams, the Oklahoma transfer, going over to USC. Tier two, you got Devin Leary from NC State, uh, Cam Rising, who led Utah to its first Pac-12 title last year, and then the aforementioned Tyler Van Dyke of the University of Miami, who had an incredible season, won ACC uh, Rookie of the Year Award. The, the, the next guy you mentioned, though, is who I want to start off with, uh, David. That's Stetson Bennett, the guy who helped Georgia to its first national the, championship. The Joe Flacco of Cal- absolutely, college Absolutely, so absolutely, honoring uh, Delaware there. Um, yeah, I mean, what, what do you do with Stetson Bennett? What, what did you do uh, in terms of evaluating what tier he belonged in? You know, uh, so my first crack at this, I did not have him listed super high because I, like everyone else, Um, cannot appreciate the true genius of Stetson Bennett. And when I shared my initial effort at this, uh, our colleague Mark Schleybaugh laughed and laughed and laughed at what an idiot I was for putting Stetson Bennett too far down this list. Uh, So I took Mark's uh, advice to heart and I've moved him up. There's, I think there's an inherent um, issue that we face when we're evaluating college quarterbacks, which is, are they guys who are going to be future first round draft pick NFL star type of guys? And we want to say those guys are great, but then there's the guys that are just great college quarterbacks, you know, to to ask them to be something more is sort of an unfair thing. And and in some ways under uh, or undercuts our own enjoyment of how good it is to watch them play. And look, was he on a team that was led by its defense last year? Yes. Was he on a team uh, that had a lot of talent? Yes. Is he as good as the guy who he beat in a national championship game? No, he is not. But he fits really well in the system that he's in. And frankly, that offense was not like chock full of superstars outside of Brock Bowers last year, probably. And he made all of them better. And he had JT Daniels looking over his shoulder the whole time. And never once did Kirby Smart flinch at saying like, yeah, maybe I need to go back to JT Daniels. Even when other people outside were saying, oh, they got to do it, they got to do it. And, and frankly, Stetson Bennett's problems in games last year, a few that there were, were not about like, oh, he's just not good enough to make these throws or do this or that. It was when he just kind of made a dumb mistake. It was a mental error usually. Uh, the, and he made tons of genuinely good plays, like plays that if it was – you know, Kyler Murray out there making them, we all would have said, oh, oh, look at Kyler Murray. But when Stetson Bennett does, it's like, that ah, must be a fluke that he did it. So I don't know. I'm not going to in any way suggest that Stetson, Stetson Bennett is um, the best quarterback in college football. He is not. I don't think he is a future first-round pa- traffic. I don't think he is a future NFL player, uh, or at least not a starter. Um, but that doesn't take away the fact that he can be a very good college quarterback that is fun to watch and plays on a team that's fun to watch. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, 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 as you as you put well here in the in the blurb about Bennett at the very end, stop picking Bennett apart and just enjoy the ride. I think that's what I'm going to try to do for the 2022 season, and uh, certainly some Georgia fans 
will be joining me. I'm fascinated by your tier three list, uh, David. A lot, a lot of ACC guys, one former ACC guy who's really blossomed in the SEC in Tennessee's Hendon Hooker. Um, you got some interesting names here at the bottom. Grayson McCall's a little more familiar, but Aiden O'Connell had a tremendous year for Purdue. Uh, Will Rogers, record-setting year for Mike Leach at Mississippi State, and he comes back with a, a pretty good receiving core around him. And then K.J. Jefferson, instrumental in Arkansas's big breakthrough under Sam Pittman, who just received a, a new contract as the coach of the Hogs. What what was your feeling about this group and 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 you know who who belonged who just missed the cut and really who could rise up you know maybe to be a tier two or tier one quarterback by the end of the year? Yeah, this group for me was sort of the wow they were much better than I thought they were like off, off the top of my head last year kind of group. Um, so I mean, you look at a guy like uh, KJ Jefferson. Like I remember kind of watching at the beginning of the year and it was sort of a very run heavy offense. And it was a lot about the backs and sort of the style that they were playing. And I thought like, well, okay, big quarterback who can run and fits well in that offense. But, you know, they're, they're sort of limited. And then he watched the games the rest of the year, like the back half of the year. He was really good and really good as a thrower too. I had severely underestimated him just in my general perception of him without kind of sitting down. And then you look at the numbers and you're like, oh, man, he was a really good quarterback. Um, Aiden O'Connell's another one like I, he loses his top two receivers and, and I admit that's a, a question and a concern there but there were five uh, power five quarterbacks that had a total QBR over 80 last year three of them are in my top tier Young Stroud and Caleb Williams one of them is the guy who won the national championship Stetson Bennett the other one's Aiden O'Connell like how many people knew that um, so you know he was a good one of those examples of guys like you sat down and you start looking at it more and more and you're like, wow, he was a lot better than I thought. And, and you mentioned those ACC guys. I mean, there's just a ton of them. I, I've uh, gone round and round trying to rank the ACC's quarterbacks. And I think you could take probably the top five or six or even seven and put them in almost any order. And you can make a reasonable case for them. And certainly Brennan Armstrong, I think, is a fascinating one because I think he's got real NFL talent. Uh, just numbers off the charts last year, uh, but going into a much different offensive system this time around with Tony Elliott taking over as head coach and uh, um, Robert and I going to Syracuse, uh, his old offensive coordinator. Um, Devin Leary, who I put up higher, Tyler Van Dyke, who I put up higher. I think that there may be a notch above just because of where their ceiling is, but you look at a guy like Sam Hartman, who is – I mean, what more does that guy need to do to prove himself as a quarterback? And he's been exceptional um, with who have either done it a bunch of times or have a lot of potential. Um, and that group that you mentioned, like as I started looking at, at quarterbacks, that makes me think it might be a pretty fun year in college football this year because it's not just about the elite talent. There's some depth, not just in the ACC or the SEC, but kind of everywhere. There really is. And, and again, I was looking at this list, trying to make it about individual players and not about leagues, but it's just natural to look at certainly the, the, the first couple of tiers and, and say, wow, the ACC is going to be loaded at quarterback. Uh, one league that I think is going to be sneaky good at quarterback, and I wanted to ask you about one of their uh, uh, QBs, is the Pac-12. You obviously have uh, Caleb Williams up high at USC, understandably, given the season that he had last year for Oklahoma, now rejoining Lincoln Riley uh, with the Trojans. You know, Dorian Thompson Robinson was a guy that I think I sent you like three or four emails yeah. about because I, I really think he is poised for a potentially excellent season. He took a major step. Uh, if you look at his completion percentage numbers going from 2020 to 2021, that was sort of the, uh, you, know, you know, Chip Kelly always talks about the watering the bamboo you know, type season where you got to water the bamboo and he doesn't do anything for three years and then it just sprouts, boom. That sort of happened for UCLA's offense last year. And I think with DTR back, that could be a really good thing. And then in tier five, and I want to ask you overall about this tier because it's really interesting. You got Quinn Ewers and Hudson Card, the two men competing for Texas's quarterback job. Hudson Card won it last year, but Quinn Ewers, the you know number one overall recruit, came, went to Ohio State early, basically for NIL, uh, left Ohio State without doing anything. He's back in his home area uh, trying to win this quarterback job against Hudson Card. 
uh, Blake Shapen from Baylor, one of the few undecided quarterback situations that was decided this spring as he won the job there for the defending Big 12 champions. Gary, Gary Bohannon, Bohannon ended up transferring to uh, South Florida. Anthony Richardson, a fascinating player from Florida. And then another USC quarterback who's no longer at USC, Jackson Dart, going to Ole Miss. He still has to beat out Luke Altmyer, but the expectation is he will be the QB1 for Lane Kiffin and the Rebels. Guy, I have to ask you about, and just this tier overall, David, is Cameron Ward going from Incarnate Word to Washington State to play for uh, Jake Dickert, who's now the permanent head coach. The idea here is for Cameron Ward to become this year's version of Bailey Zappi, who went from uh, Incarnate Word to Western Kentucky with Zach Kitley, lit it up, all sorts of record last year for Western Kentucky uh, in his only season with the Hilltoppers. Can Cam Ward do that in your mind for Washington State? And what do you think overall about this Tier 5, which is uh, headlined so hot right now? <laughs> um, yeah, well, first of all, anytime you can get a Zoolander reference into a story, you do that. Um, this is the tier that, to me, None of these guys will be in this tier at the end of the year. Some of them are going to, you're going to look at it and say, why weren't they in tier one or tier two? Some of them you're going to say, that guy should have been in tier 20, not good at all. I don't know exactly what to expect with any of them. I just know that all of them have significant potential that if things add up right, they're going to be very, very good. Um, but, but Ward is really the fascinating one because uh, whereas you look at the other ones, there's minimal experience under their belts. Uh, Ward has the, the game time. He's taken the snaps. He's just taken them at the FCS level. Um, but he looks really good. He's super talented. He goes to a place that I think was better than expected last year, but also just absolute chaos. I mean, nobody went through more chaos last year than Wazoo. I, I think it sets up really nicely. I almost think the biggest disadvantage that he has is the Bailey Sappy comparison because, uh, what happened with Bailey Zappi, I think we'll look back years from now and say, man, what a crazy season. We'll never see anything like that again. Right now we're saying, like, maybe we'll see it again this year. I don't think we will. I think what Bailey Zappi and Zach Kitley and those guys did it at Western Kentucky last year, which, by the way, also included, like, two or three of his Houston Baptist receivers that went with him to WKU also. Um, there was just a level – they were set up for a level of success there uh, that, that they certainly took advantage of. They hit the nail on the head perfectly. Um, I don't know that you can repeat that. And I think this is a little bit more of a challenging situation at Washington State. So I think temper the expectations a little bit from Bailey Zappi. But can this be the best quarterback that, that Washington State's had in quite a while? I, I certainly am not going to argue with that. I think there's a reasonable possibility that it is. Yeah, and they have a great tradition there. Ryan Leaf, a former quarterback, was on the nominees for the College of Ball Hall of Fame that came out earlier this week. You mentioned it was Houston Baptist, not Incarnate Word. Don't want to upset any of the folks around the Houston Baptist program because that's where Zach Kitley and obviously Bailey Zappi went from uh, to, to Western Kentucky, and now both are on to uh, different challenges. Uh, Zach Kitley, now the OC at his alma mater, Texas Tech. Such so an exciting uh, storyline here. There are 25 quarterback tiers that David Hale put together, so everybody should, We're going through all that. of them one by one, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, I, I did want, you know, they're not in exact order. So, but, but I, I, I last thing I was going to ask you about this, David, is, is there somebody from, you know, kind of the double digit tiers that you think could just move way up? I know it's not just about, uh, you know, tier you know, 23 is, is way worse than tier six because they're different categories more than anything else. But it, it, you know, th those lower tiers, there's someone that you think could just take off. And then we're going to be talking about as a national name in November that people really, aren't thinking about right now you know it's a good question because uh, first of all um i was really doing my best to try to like parse uh quarterback jobs that i really frankly know nothing about <laughs> like i all right yeah, i'll tell you who where i think uh you know new mexico state ought to be ranked but i i honestly my my level of insight into that program is probably not super high at the moment um yeah i think i mean i think there's a handful of spots so i i ranked the cincinnati uh job relatively low but would it shock me if whoever wins that job becomes um sort of a, a next desmond ritter type of player no cincinnati's a great program with a great head coach and 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 uh is in a position to be pretty successful right off the bat that wouldn't surprise me at all um you know i look i look at garrett trader at syracuse who was a blue chip recruit had a good year but not a great year last year mostly as a runner but is inheriting that same OC who turned Brennan Armstrong into 
a numbers machine and playing in that Dino Babers st- style of offense. Like I'm intrigued about what, what's going to happen there. Um, you know, I think, look, TCU, Max Duggan and Chandler Morris, I'm not sure who wins that job. Either one has some level of success under their belt, but now you get uh, uh, Sonny Dykes coming in and, and that style of offense, and he's had a lot of success with quarterbacks. What happens there? Um, and then there's the, all, the whole of Tier 11 to me is maybe the most fascinating one. I, I, tab- I named this one. Maybe this year is the year they put it all together. And I have Bo Nix, Graham Mertz, Jeff Sims, and DJ Oyungle in there. <laughs> all four of those guys, based on like their first start or two, you would have said future stars, high recruits, they're going to be awesome. And all of them have been pretty darn average to bad since then. Is this the year that one of them, I mean, this is sort of a category, you mentioned Dorian Thompson Robinson, we probably would have put him in this category, maybe even last year, and he blossomed. I think one of those guys will take a step and become the quarterback we thought they might be. Um, it'll be really interesting if it's Bo Nix at Oregon after he just ran Auburn's fan, fandom into the ground and probably gave multiple people coronaries, but, and then goes off to Oregon and is great. Be interesting if that happens. Um, but, but DJ Oyungle, like who would have thought the year that he had last year was what it's going to happen. He turns back into the guy that we thought he could have been this year. Nobody's going to be shocked by that. No. And, and really in the case of both, uh, Uyunglele and, and Nick's, if they play well, their teams are probably winning their conferences. Cause I'm not ready to just anoint USC as, as the, uh, uh, you know, the Pac-12 champions for the next 40 years, like a lot of people, but you know, Utah might have something to say about that. And certainly, certainly with Clemson, uh, you know, they'll be challenged by NC State, maybe Miami, maybe some others, but they still have probably the most talent in in the league. And if DJ can put it together, you know, they they may be back in the college football playoffs. So tier 11 is an essential one. If David Hale has it covered, guys. You should really read this piece. It's it's unbelievable. And I, I really didn't think we would get much mileage out of the letter Q, but uh, you know, David, you do so many things well. And and one of them is covering us on our alphabet lead up to the college football season. Well, this is also, I wanted to bring up, like, can we, should we spend some time talking about the Quantico Marines devil dogs, which played uh, football from 1919 to 1972. Uh, They once beat an army team that was coached by Dwight Eisenhower. uh, And uh, they were, uh, Oh, they also had an annual game of against the Baltimore city fire department. So um, there you go. Things, things that you just had to know by listening to today's college football podcast. But uh, it was a great show, David. I always appreciate you. Uh, go Cubs. I know it's been uh, rough and will continue to be rough. Uh, for hey, the rain out last night. The yeah, the rain out. You can't lose if you get rained out. I know it, uh, you were hoping to see him. But uh, well, safe travels back to Charlotte. Wanted to thank Miami Athletic Director Dan Radakovich for joining us. Great conversation with him. Uh, we will be moving on to the letter R. A little bit more to talk about team-wise. Uh, but we certainly uh, did quite well, I think, with the letter Q. Wanted to thank producers Taylor and Sarah, and of course you for listening to us here on the ESPN College Football Podcast.